I'd like to personally thank you for tuning in to this broadcast. At Highview Baptist Church, we exist to lead people to know and follow Jesus. We're so thankful that you're taking the time to dig into God's Word with us. And we'd encourage you to check Highview out more on our website at highview.org. We hope and pray that the Lord is speaking to you in and through His Word and that you truly will come to know and follow Jesus. Church, good morning. Hey, so great to see you. Please, as Pastor Brian mentioned, turn your Bible to the Gospel of John. I hope you're pumped because I'm pumped right now. Let's go. Getting back in a Gospel narrative coming out of the Psalms. Uh, But truly, John is so unique and rich among the Gospels. We think about Matthew, Mark, and Luke. They're often referred to as the synoptics. And that word literally means seen together or, or seeing the same thing. It's the connotation it holds. Because Matthew, Mark, and Luke have so much overlap and so much commonality at times, direct overlap. But the difference is in John, it includes so many things that the synoptics do not, do not even make mention of. And it doesn't include certain things that they do. It kind of stands on its own. And it's already been mentioned, a great focus of the Gospel of John is clearly setting before us the identity of Jesus. If you can walk through John and not have seen clearly who Jesus is, you didn't really read it. You didn't pay attention because he makes, I mean, clear, strong efforts throughout the book uh, to make it clear in so many different ways. Back again in that purpose statement, John 20, verse 31, it says, these things are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. Could we just say that that's also a good purpose statement for the entire Bible, for for that matter? That's the point. Not studying this just because, oh, that's interesting or piquing our curiosity. We dig into God's word because we receive Jesus as the Son of God and who he is and what he has done for eternal life and the forgiveness of sin. We've titled this sermon series, I Am, and if you're familiar with the Gospel of John, you know why. I mean, throughout it, John puts those seven I Am statements together, clearly revealing what what this beginning prologue in John 1 addresses, and that is that Jesus is, in fact, God. John 1, 1 through 18 is really dense, guys. So I'm just gonna give you a heads up. This is about to be dense theologically today, but it's so good because this is the difference in us understanding and worshiping Jesus rightly or missing his identity and rejecting him. We have to know with precision who is our savior. Listen, I don't know if you like Brazilian steakhouses, but that's what this is about to be today, okay? So if you've been there, just turn your little card on green and let's go. You know what I'm saying? Stand with me. Let's read John 1, 1 through 18. There's so much here about our Lord. And it's so good because as we know him according to the truth, we are drawn to worship him. Let's read John 1, 1 through 5 to begin. We'll stop there for now. In the beginning was the word And the word was with God, and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Would you pray with me? Lord Jesus, you are the king. You are the word became flesh. You are truly God, truly man, and truly our savior. Thank you, Jesus, that we have this, that we can read this, and that we can know you how you ought ought to be known. Lord, would you just help us in this time by your spirit to understand, but more than to understand, to receive you, Lord, for who you are. And I pray it in your name, Jesus. Amen. You may be seated. I've titled our time with a question, who is this word? 
who is this word? Spoiler alert, I'm just gonna go from the very beginning. If you're not familiar with the Gospel of John, that was talking about Jesus. The word is in fact Jesus. And we know that explicitly from verse 14 because it says the word became flesh. Three very simple points. They're, they're, they may not be all at times simple in their explanation, but they're simple in terms of stating them. Jesus is God, Jesus is Savior, Jesus is man. That's where we're going. Jesus is God, Jesus is our Savior, Jesus is man. So let's jump in here the first there's a lot going on in verse one, you know what I mean? Jesus is God, first point if you're taking notes. John mentions the word three times, three times the word. In the beginning was the word, the word was with God and the word was God. The word he uses in the Greek language is logos. It's a word that simply by de dictionary definition just means word. But it's not so much the dictionary definition that makes this first verse so special, but it's the context in the first century in which John employs its usage. That word has a lot of freight behind it for different people in different ways. For a Jew in the first century to hear of the logos, for you to think as a Jew about the word of God, there is nothing really that you would treasure more than the word of God. Because what was the word for the Jewish people? It was the ultimate form of God's self-disclosure. The word is how God was known. It's how God communicated with them. It's how God revealed himself to them. And more than that, to say in the beginning was the word, a Jewish individual would have said uh, just at that first part of the verse, well, amen, absolutely the word was in the beginning. Because this is even written like Genesis 1.1, if you notice. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. In the beginning was the word. They're very similar. Intentionally, John's drawing their mind there. Because how did God create the world? Let there be light. He spoke. It was his word. So for a Jewish individual, you associated the word of God with his revelation of himself and his omnipotence, specifically his creative power. But for the Greeks, it would have been different, especially those coming out of the Greek philosophical tradition. About five or 600 BC, we're, kind of, we're going back before even this was written, there was a guy named Heraclitus who was a Greek philosopher and he began to develop this idea of logos among Greek philosophers in general and more carried it out over the centuries. But essentially what they were seeking to do was look and observe the world and explain the, the order, the inherent order and structure of the world in the universe. They were looking around and saying, wow, the human body functions with such order and vast ecosystems teem with life and all these relationships and it functions well together. Or look at how a tree responds to light and water and it grows. There is order in the universe. How did they explain that order? They decided to explain it, many of them, with the logos, which was not a God or a person. It was more of an impersonal force that they referred to. How are all things upheld in order and structure? Oh, well, the logos, that's how they thought of it. And so John has just taken what has a lot of meaning behind it for different people. And he said, in the beginning was the word, but then he starts stating other things. It would definitely cost somebody's attention. The word was with God. The word was God. And then if the anvil didn't already drop hard enough there, it does in verse two. He, we're not talking about a proposition when he's talking about the word. He's talking about a person. He, he was in the beginning with God. So immediately, I mean, if you're any one, or two of the, uh, any one of these groups and you're reading this for the first time and you're hearing this, you'd have been like throwing on the brakes. Hold on, what are you talking about? Because what John has just said in employing this word is that Jesus is the definitive revelation of who God is. He is the word. He is the definitive, final, ultimate revelation. Why? Because the word is God. This is who he is. And he is the one who is omnipotent. And for the Greeks, he's saying, listen, it's not an impersonal kind of natural law principle that upholds the universe together. He has a name. Jesus does this. So in Hebrews chapter one, verse three, if you remember in the book of Hebrews, it says, Jesus upholds the universe by the word of his power. John brings us in to the absolute supremacy of Jesus in his identity. 
So please, I hope we're hearing before we've gone any farther. There is no one like Jesus. He is above all things. He is before all things. He is preeminent. He is supreme. He is sovereign. He's the king of kings. He's the only God. He's the only creator. This is what John is bringing out. But now that we know that, we need to feel the weight. Okay, this is the weight of who Jesus is. Let's look again at verse one. And I wanna break it up. I actually have a slide that's broken up into, into just the statements. First, in the beginning was the word. So we know he's talking about Jesus. What is he saying? Jesus is eternal. Jesus is uncreated. Jesus has always existed. Jesus existed before the world was ever made. In the beginning was the word. The word was with God. Jesus, second, in his personhood is distinct and separate from the father. Are you tracking? Are we tracking? He was with God. He was with the father. Jesus separate and distinct as the eternal son from God the father. Yet the word was God. He is with the Father, separate from the Father, yet in his person, he, Jesus, the Son, is truly God himself. Now, sometimes people say, you know, the Trinity is this made up thing. You know, the, P, the church made up the Trinity and the Trinity was invented in the fourth century. No, it wasn't. We're reading it right here. This was written in the first century. John's telling us. There's a Trinitarian theology that's being brought forward that Jesus is separate from the Father, yet he is truly God. If we were to expand across the New Testament, this is what we would believe fully about the Trinity and actually put it up on the screen because I think when we come to a chapter like this in Scripture and we're talking about our Lord in his identity, we need to have a great precision of language. There is one God who exists eternally in three persons, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Each person is separate and distinct, yet fully God. And I book into the statement, there is one God. It is very important we speak about this with precision. Sometimes people say stuff like, God manifested himself in three forms. That's heresy, okay? He didn't come in three forms. He didn't come in three modes. He didn't come in three ways. No, there are three persons within one God. Now explain that logically. None of us are gonna be able to do it or comprehend fully who our God is. But if you deny it, you're a heretic. Because what we're seeing here is what John is saying. In the beginning was the word. The word was with God. The word was God. We're receiving who Jesus is. In context of, of the Godhead, three and one, we, we believe this, we confess this. Why well, even put it up on the, on the screen? If there's any question at this point as to whether Jesus is God, all you have to do is read verse three and it's clarified. All things were made through him. So if there's any question, how do you make it clear as John, hey, I mean Jesus is God. Well, you say he created all things and that pretty much nails it. All things were made through him and then this statement is important. Without him was not anything made that was made. So if you have everything in a made category, nothing that is in the made category was made apart from Jesus. And that would include Jesus, right? He's not made. I know I'm repeating myself a lot, but this is very, 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 very important. Jesus is the eternal son he is truly God. He is uncreated. He has always existed as Lord and God. Track him. John puts before us, Jesus, I mean, can you imagine hearing this in the first century, even as a, as a Jew steeped in the scripture, faithful before the Lord, and all of a sudden you begin to realize, wait a minute, Jesus cast Adam and Eve out of the garden. Jesus flooded the earth. Jesus is there at the call of Abraham, calling Abraham, meeting Moses at Sinai, destroying Jericho, loving David, leading Elijah. This is him and we can know him. Please, please hear me this morning. There are many cult groups that we could look at that deny the deity of Christ. But you need to know where there is a denial of the deity of Christ, he is not being worshiped. He is God. 
He is Lord. He is, that's what Thomas says. If you get to John 20, when he touches the scars in Jesus' hands, he says, my Lord and my God. This is so vitally important because if we're not worshiping Jesus according to knowledge, we're not worshiping Jesus at all. We have to know him in accordance with the truth. So first, who is he? He's the son who is with the father. He is truly God. He was in the beginning. All things were made through him. But it's not something that's far off from us because what John begins to put forward is he's our savior. Verses four through 13 are focused squarely upon this. He is our savior. Look at verse four. In him was life and the life was the light of men. Now we could say of every person in this room right now, you have life, you're alive, I'm alive, but we don't have life like what John means about Jesus having life. We don't have life like him. We're alive because of him. He's alive because of no one. This is what is understood as the aseity of Christ. The aseity of Christ, meaning that he is perfectly sufficient in himself. He is self-existent. He's not dependent upon anyone or anything for life. He has life in himself and he's always been alive eternally. He's the source of life for everything else. In him was life and the life was the light of men. So one, we're all alive and living and breathing because he gave us life and we're dependent upon him. But more than that, he doesn't just mean it in a physical way. He means it in a spiritual, hopeful kind of way. Verse five, the light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. I know somebody was excited. That's pretty good news. The light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. What it's telling us is that Jesus is immutable. He never changes. He's self-existent. He has life in himself. And that's good news for us because he's broken into history. He's broken into the world. His light of who he is has shined into the darkness and the darkness is not overcoming. It can't take hold of him. It doesn't win is what it means. So this immediately roots out any kind of, you ever heard of like dualism where, oh, you know, the world is, you know, it's just part dark and part light. And it's all about just, you know, we need to act on the right things. We need to act on things that are good and not on things that are dark. No, 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 no. The world is dark and our creator is separate from the world and he is light and he is holy. And when he shows up, there's not a competition. He just obliterates it. He just wins. The light shines in the darkness and the darkness can't handle it. That may be my translation. <laughs> like, no, I'm, that's, that's a joke. So don't take it too literally. <laughs> right, it can't stop this. And so we don't need to miss who Jesus is. The true light, or he's back in verse six, excuse me, verse six, there was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but came to bear witness about the light. So he's setting up also many things in this first chapter. He's setting up the ministry of John the Baptist. We're not gonna go into that because that's next week. But ultimately, John was a precursor. He was a, someone who was preparing the way for Jesus' coming. This was prophesied in the Old Testament, two particular texts, Malachi 3 and Isaiah 40. Hundreds of years before Christ, it was promised by God that there would be a man who would come saying, hey, get ready, the Messiah's here. Well, that's John the Baptist's role. He's bearing witness. Because why? Verse nine, the true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. Don't you wanna know him? Don't we wanna know the light? Don't you wanna not miss the light? It's very important. But listen to this. Tragically, verse 10, he was in the world and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. This is the nature of sin, that Jesus comes into the world, the very world that he made, the very people he made, us, and on our own, we will not receive him for who he is in our sin. We will reject him. All people do. It's as if he's come into his own house and has been treated as a stranger belongs to him, but not just the world. Verse 11, he came to his own. Now he's talking about Israel. He came to his own people and his own people did not receive him. And just again, I mean, the, 
The deity of Christ is all over John 1. The reason they're his people is because he is the God that called them. They were already his people when he came to the world. He came to his own people and his own people rejected him. The Romans crucified him. The religious leaders and the Jews, they crucified him. We all were a part of this. This is how much sin corrupts the mind and the heart that we cannot recognize the one who made us apart from his intervention. But that's an important qualification, apart from his intervention, because we just read the light broke into the darkness. He has intervened. And that's why the gospel was clearly put forward for the first time in verse 12, but to all who did receive him, so here's the hope, but to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, there's the purpose of the gospel. It's to believe in Christ. It's to receive Christ for who he is. To all who received him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. That's a pretty good right. I want that right. I don't know if you want that right. We need to want that right, to be his children. Last year, I saw this ad campaign of a prominent politician pop up several times. And they said on this campaign, I believe that all people are children of God. You know, that's really sweet sounding and might get you some votes, but that's theologically incorrect. All people are not children of God. We just read it. You have to be given that right. We are all made in God's image. We all have inherent value and dignity because God made us, but we don't all belong to the Father. A right has to be given. John draws a line in verse 12. There are two kinds of people in the world. There are people who are in right relationship with the Father and people who are not. People who have been given the right to become children of God and people who are in their sin. That's the only two kinds of people there are in the world. And the good news though is, but to all who receive him, who believed in him, he gave the right. What's the right? I personally think John here, I mean, he's talking about justification. The right, how do you get the right When you're estranged in your sin and you're cut off from the Lord in your sin, do you have the right? Well, your sin has to be atoned for. Your sin has to be dealt with. The darkness had to be dealt with. That's exactly what Christ has done. The light shines in the darkness. God became a man. Jesus walked the earth. He fulfilled the law, which is required for right relationship with the Father. There has to be a perfection. You have to be perfect. We all understand that. That's why we sing all sufficient merit because only he does that. You have to be perfect to enter heaven. And not only have we not fulfilled the law, we've broken the law and sin has to be atoned for, but praise God, the lamb of God, Jesus has broken into the world and though darkness crucified him, he lives in power. And Jesus has paid the debt for our sin. He has paid it all. He has paid the price for our sin at the cross. He has bore our sin in his body. He has fulfilled the requirement of the law. He's been raised from the dead. So that is the case for all who receive him, who believe in the name of Jesus, you will be given the right to become a child of God. Do you believe in Jesus? Have you been given that right? He came to give you that right. Would you receive Christ by faith? But when it happens, I love that he already starts talking about being born again before we even get to chapter three. It's radical what happens to you. He says, he gave the right to become children of God, verse 13, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. We don't go all the way here either because this is in John 3. There's so many themes being presented to us, but it's so radical, you're a new person is what he's saying. Did you, cho- did you choose to be born the first time? Did that happen by your will? This is so radical, a work that the Lord does. You have to be spiritually born again made a new creation, 2 Corinthians 5, 17. And when you're born of God, when you've received the right, it says you're born not of the blood, not of blood, meaning this isn't about physical descent. This would have struck struck the Jews in a specific way because many thought that they were right with God because of their ethnic descent from Abraham. 
But this same thing happens in the Bible Belt. Because I talk to people all the time and I was like, well, you know, why do you, when, when did you become a Christian? Well, I was born one. This just said that's impossible. Not born of blood. You can't be born a Christian or I've been one my whole life. You can't be. You're not a Christian by affiliation. You're not a, a, a Christian by affiliation with family or blood or anything. No, it's not of the blood. It's not of the will of the flesh. Meaning you and I could never do anything enough to be perfect. It's not in our own effort, nor is it of the will of man. We don't just say one day, hey, I'm gonna turn myself into a child of God by our own will. <laughs> he has to act upon you. But of God, but of God, you must be born of God. You must receive by faith who Jesus is and say, Lord Jesus, I wanna be changed. I see my sin. I see that I am estranged from you. Lord, I want the right to be a child of the Father. Jesus, I believe in you and call upon his name. He will save you. He's made it possible how? He is God and he is savior because he took on humanity. Jesus is man. Third point, verse 14. The word became flesh and dwelled among us and we have seen his glory. Glory as of the only son from the father, full of grace and truth. We could do a sermon on that one right there by itself. The word, who is the word but Jesus, the eternal son, the one who is with the father, the one who is God, Jesus became flesh. Jesus took on humanity. Jesus took on a human nature and dwelt among us. The language here is very specific in the Greek, especially for the Jewish people, because he, it doesn't just mean dwelled, it means tented up. It means tabernacled. In the Old Testament, where was the presence of God? In the tent, in the tent of meeting, in the temple. John has just said, you know, Jesus is the temple because he's God and he's here. That's why in John 2, 2, Jesus says, destroy this temple in three days, I'll raise it up. He's claiming deity. The word became flesh, dwelt among us, but don't miss this. In taking on a human nature, this did not diminish his deity. It did not detract or lessen from it. He didn't give up some of his deity because we've seen his glory. Who has glory? Only God has glory. We've seen his glory. Glory is what? As of the only son from the father, full of grace. Aren't you glad that's what it says? full of grace and truth. What is Jesus like? He is gracious to us. He shows up in the truth to be gracious, to give forgiveness, to heal, to bless, to show you kindness, to love you. This is who he is. But just as important as it is to be precise about the Trinity, we need to be precise about the person of Jesus. And here's how I would encourage you to talk about this. We say Jesus is truly God and truly man. Let's just say it together. Jesus is truly God and truly man. I think that confession is very important. Historically, it's been confessed by the church that the person of Jesus are two natures. He is truly God and truly man. I wanna read some things to be precise. First thing I wanna to read to you is the creed, the Chalcedonian Creed from 451. So this was a couple of years back. It says this, he is one in the same Christ, son, Lord, meaning he is one person to be acknowledged in two natures. Inconfusedly mean not to be confused, not to be changed, not to be divided, not to be separated. The distinction, this line is very important. The distinction of the natures being by no means taken away by the union. What that means is Jesus didn't become less God when he took on humanity. And Jesus isn't less of a man because he's God. He's truly God and truly man. 
but rather, he says, the property of each nature being preserved and concurring in one person. I wanna read you another one. This one's by John Gill. It says, by the assumption of the human nature, the word, Jesus, took it. The, and these are my parentheses. He took it, the human nature, into personal union with himself. Christ remained what he was, namely God, and became what he was not, namely man. The natures are not confounded and blend together and so make a third nature, nor are they separated and divided so as to constitute per two persons, a divine person and a human person. But they are so united as to be but one person. And this is such a union as can never be dissolved. What this means is Jesus will be man forever. The God man forever. And it is the foundation of the virtue and efficacy of all Christ's works and actions as mediator. Here's what that means. Jesus could not have atoned for our sin if this is not true. Why does this matter? Because if Jesus did not take on a human nature, we would have no clue who God is. We would not know him. This is why Christmas and the incarnation is so incredible. It's so wonderful. Emmanuel, God with us, we can know him. Why does this matter? Because if he is not truly God and truly man, he could not atone for sin. Because if Jesus did not take on humanity, he could not have fulfilled the law. If Jesus did not take on humanity, he would not have died at the cross. But just as importantly, if Jesus is not divine, if he is not God, the price of his life would have never sufficed to pay for our debt. The debt we owe is eternal because the sin we've committed is against an eternal God. And when you sin against an eternal God, the only thing that happens to pay for that is eternal judgment. And the only one who can pay for an eternal judgment is the eternal king. He's truly God, he's truly man. But here's the thing that I get most excited about. Why does it matter? Because one day, we are going to step into his presence and you are going to be able to embrace the son of God. You're gonna see him. You're gonna be able to grab hold of him and worship him and thank him and be with him and talk with him because of this. There is nothing better than Jesus. John bore witness, verse 15, about him and cried out, this was of he of whom I said, he who comes after me ranks before me because he was before me. We would all be wise to join John in that confession. He must increase I must decrease, he will say later. For from his fullness, who? Jesus, his person. We have all received grace upon grace. Did you see the emphasis? We all need to hear this today. He is not far off from us and he does not come in an impersonal way. He comes in grace and truth. He comes with grace upon grace. The law was given through Moses, which was a grace to have the 10 commandments, to know God's character and to know what God required for you ultimately to enter heaven. But it was also a curse because we couldn't do it. That's why it's grace in place of grace or grace upon grace because grace and truth came through Jesus Christ because Jesus did what the law could not. And here's how he ends it. No one has ever seen God, the only God who is at the Father's side. He has made him known. No one has ever seen God. But then he says, the only God who is at the Father's side. Who is that? Jesus. He has made him known. We have seen him. We can, we will see him. Do you trust in Jesus? Not the cultural conception of Jesus in the Bible Belt South. The biblical Jesus, the one revealed in the scripture, truly God, truly man, the eternal son of the father who came in human flesh to die for sins, to be raised from the dead, to offer true life and forgiveness to all who believe. Do you believe in him? Trust in Jesus for salvation and for his person 
for eternal life. Would you pray with me? Jesus, thank you for revealing who you are, for making it so abundantly clear. Lord, in your word, we don't have to be confused that you are God and you have made yourself perfectly known in your humanity and you've done so to save us. Lord, I pray that we would respond to you how you rightfully deserve, which is glory. I pray, Jesus, in your name. Amen.